Hello and welcome back to Watching Brief for the week of the 28th of August 2023. I am joined as ever by my co-host Mr Andy Brockman and we're recording on the first day of September, what feels kind of like the first day of, of autumn. Uh, and you know we may well still have some hot days ahead but uh, uh, I'm definitely glad to have my voice back this week regardless of the weather. How are you doing Andy? Uh, we're 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 good, thank you. Um, it's been very strange this week. It's um, as you say, it's been the the last flurry of allegedly summer. Mm. Although apparently, first week in autumn is going to be hotter than it was over the August bank holiday at the beginning of the week. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, obviously, for those of us in England, the I know I know you're almost in Scotland. Um, but um, for those of us in England, the um, the last bank holiday of the year, last Brits being so poor when it comes to public holidays compared to much of the rest of the world, um, it seems like now a very long way to the winter solstice. Mm. It does indeed, it does. But, you know, we we, uh, we nonetheless have archaeological news to keep us going from uh, from week to week. And um, even though it has been the, the traditional silly season, um, there has been a lot to talk about, and we'll be definitely coming back to the um, uh, the British, British Museum towards the end of this week's episode. Uh, we also have an interview with uh, the wonderful Rhys Booth, uh, a follow-up to his actually 100% accurate prediction as to how uh, 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 legal issues might arise in Western Australia. I, I, I was a bit concerned, actually. I think you know, Mystic Rhys, what else might he come up with? Is, is, is he going to become some sort of um, Oz version of the Oracle at Delphi? In fact, he's, he, his, 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 um, his predictions are a lot clearer than the, uh, the, the Oracle at Delphi, from what I remember in my uh, ancient exactly. history. Yeah, it was quite uncanny. Uh, but mm. before then, uh, before all of that happens, we have some things to keep an eye on, some updates, etc, etc. And uh, we're going to start with Crooked House, uh, the fire at Crooked House, um, which continues to get uh, international attention, actually, certainly local attention. And you were just telling me about uh, a, uh, a, 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 a ritual that's arisen around the ruins of the Crooked House pub? Yeah, new viewers start here. If you remember at the beginning of August, um, the fire at the Crooked House at Himley in the Black Country in the West Midlands um, caught local, then national, and then actually international uh, attention. Uh, it's received a lot of coverage. Mm. This is the um, former 18th century farmhouse that had been converted into a pub and was famous for basically not being straight. Mm. And the fact that you could roll a beer bottle up the bar according to the, the optical illusion. Um, it, um, at the, as I said, at the beginning of August, it burnt down in a mysterious fire, and I'll come back to the fire in, in a minute. Um, but there was a huge outpouring of anger and frustration locally that this had been allowed to happen because it was a, a local landmark. And many people had, uh, as we discussed before, many people had, um, you know, it featured in their their lives as somewhere, even if you, you just went once for a drink, it was a, it was a mm -hmm. place that everybody knew. Mm -hmm. um, subsequent to the fire, it was demolished um, in, within 48 hours, apparently without planning permission. And that's still being investigated by uh, South Staffordshire Council. But um, as part of the sorting out of the legal and logistical mess that basically left a pile of bricks and wreckage on the site of the pub, um, a contractor has been called in to clean and palletize and store safely, securely, bricks from the pub. Now, obviously, that's really important for two reasons. One, there was, again, anger that some bricks and bits of wreckage uh, identified with the pub have been appearing on uh, platforms like eBay mm -hmm. as souvenirs. Mm -hmm. um, and that angered people because there's a, a strong move to try and get the pub rebuilt, uh, as was the case uh, in, in, in two other um, illegal, unlawful demolitions of pubs in mm -hmm. the UK recently. Uh, but you can't do that without the materials. And, if you, and, and the, the rule of thumb in these things is you use as much original material as possible. Mm. So if you've got original bricks, then then you'll you, you'll, you'll reuse them. Um, so anyway, um, the, um, the 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 contractor uh, was appointed by the council. They called Putnam Construction Services. So this mm -hmm. appears to have been taken out of the hands of the nominal owners of the site. Mm. Um, and their brief was, as, as I say, to uh, retain 
bricks on site safely. Mm. Um, now, in addition to that, uh, and in fact, as part of this, uh, a, a local singer songwriter called Johnny Cole is due to perform at the Crooked House site um, tomorrow, as we record that Saturday. Um, in a sort of, they, they seem to have sort of improvised a ceremony to mark the end of the palletization of the bricks. Um, and as part of the ceremony, they're going to place locks on the containers which are storing the bricks, which should secure them from uh, potential thieves. Hmm. Uh, it's at midday tomorrow, followed by entertainment, um, and people are invited to turn up, but um, not to park at the site because parking parking is very limited. There are no to park elsewhere and, and, and walk to the site. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting, really. This it, it, this really has caught people's imagination, and now it's almost becoming part of the local folklore. There's, you know, a tradition is springing up to protect the site. It's almost sort of. Um, atavistic you know it it, it, it it's uh it, the site's almost being embodied with a physicality mm. Mm. uh in 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 the in, in the local culture so i personally speaking i'd love to be there i'd love to see it um but um good luck to them and with parliament returning on monday um the the, the autumn session of parliament begins on the 4th of September on Monday, um, almost exactly a month after the fire. Mm. Uh, we will see whether uh, Marco Longhi, the local MP, is uh, sticks to his word of, of raising the issue with uh, Community Secretary Michael Gove, um, and uh, uh, whether any legislation to give more protection to community assets like pubs from unauthorised demolition uh, comes forward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, fair enough. I mean, in this in, in this instance, it seems a little bit also like the old adage: you don't know what it, what you've got until it's gone. Um, mm. You know the uh, the 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 reaction to the loss of this pub um, is definitely gaining traction, presumably because more and more people have that sort of sense that they could have visited it, even if they didn't visit it regularly um, in their day to day lives. Mm. That's absolutely right, mm. and in fact, it. It's, uh, across the country, we're seeing more and more reports of suspicious fires at heritage buildings. I mean, just last night here in London, um, in the suburb of Croydon, the local media was reporting uh, two, in fact, what were described as derelict, i.e. currently unoccupied pubs, mm. um, have been subject of mysterious fires simultaneously. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and um, I should add as well, just in, as a final update on the uh, on the Crooked House story, um, again, we have one of the reasons we're being circumspect about what we're saying is there's still a live police investigation. Um, at, uh, towards the end of August, um, in fact, on the 25th of August, the um, South, uh, Staffordshire Police updated the um, their website in terms of the investigation, and um, confirmed that. Uh, well, I'll just read. The, I'll just read the opening paragraphs of the press release. Um, Detectives investigating the fire at the Crooked House pub in Himley are continuing to appeal for information following the arrest of two men. A 66-year-old man from Dudley, that's locally, um, and a 33-year-old man from Milton Keynes were arrested on suspicion of arson with intent to endanger life. Today, 25th of August, both men have been released under conditional police bail as we continue to investigate the circumstances which led to the fire. And um, then they go on to um, reiterate that they understand the strength of feeling in the community. They ask for more information, but they also ask people not to speculate about what happened and who was responsible for it. Mm. Mm. Um, we, we, we'll, we'll await further developments. A couple of things, a couple of legal points, really, on the press release, just to finish. Um, conditional bail means that um, they may have had uh, conditions placed such as they have to report to a police station at regular intervals. They may have had passports removed. Um, various other conditions can be applied when somebody is bailed when they're under investigation. Mm. Uh, the other point to make is that um, the police were uh, very clear that they were arrested on suspicion of arson with intent to endanger life. Um, uh, now, it's not necessarily, uh, if you look at the legal definitions, that doesn't mean necessarily that... Uh, a building was occupied at the time, although it could have been. Mm -hmm. um, 
but um, it, it, it extends to thing uh, to, to issues such as uh, firefighters being put at risk and so on. Mm. Uh, the idea that uh, not it isn't just arson, deliberate setting of fire, but it's reckless in that yeah. you don't care whether anybody gets hurt or not. Yeah. And that is at the upper end of arson offences under English law. So the charges, if they come, uh, and that that um, uh, that aspect of the investigation is continued through, um, the charges that anybody might face uh, as a result of the Crooked House fight are, could be potentially pretty serious. And if anyone's found guilty, they could end up doing quite a bit of prison time. Mm. Uh, next, we have a retraction note. Uh, in the journal Nature, this is available at nature.com, at least the, um, the, the, the summary of it is. Uh, then the retraction notice with regards to an article titled The Hopwell uh, Airburst Event, 1699 to uh, 1567 years ago, uh, i.e. 252 to 383 CE. Uh, retraction note? Airburst events. Yeah. This sounds an awful lot like the like a like a <coughs> younger Dryas adjacent event. Sorry, I said the coffee part <laughs> out loud there. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, although the the implication of the retraction is this is a Hancock and Bull story. Oi. Um, no, look, look, this this is a really interesting situation this deals with a, 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 a publication of a journal called scientific reports mm -hmm. um the article as you say was called the, the, the hopewell airburst event 1699 to 1567 years ago 252 to 383 common era mm -hmm. um it had a number of authors and um it uh was published um really only um in uh, in july 2022 and I'll just read you the, the abstract of the original article. Mm. It, it, it cites meteorites, uh, various um, chemical inclusions, and burned charcoal-rich Hopewell habitation services demonstrate that a cosmic airburst event occurred over the Ohio River Valley during the late Holocene. A comet-shaped earthwork was constructed near the airburst epicentre. 29 radiocarbon ages established the event occurred between 252 and 383 CE, a time when 69 near-Earth comets, comets were documented. Mm. While Hopewell people survived the catastrophic event, it likely contributed to their cultural decline. The Hopewell airburst event expands our understanding of the frequency and impact of cataclysmic cosmic events on complex human societies. Mm -hmm. Now, you can see that an article like that is catnip to... Well, people who believe yeah. in the cat cat mm. yeah, cat cataclysmic mm. um, drivers to human events, mm. and the you know uh, at its most extreme event, it's the <coughs> Atlantis conspiracy theories, mm -hmm. um, and um, the theories of uh, you know uh, writers like Graham Hancock, mm. um, who who has talked about this kind of event, but and not exclusively Hancock. Uh, um, catastrophic events driven by comets have been part of the discourse really since uh modern geology and archaeology and um soil chemistry started really working together mm -hmm. about 40 50 years ago um and the, the idea of identifying for example volcanic winters um caused by volcanic eruptions uh, well it, it, and to be fair it, arguably some of this, has, this stuff actually has its origins in fiction as well fiction uh, yeah. combined with those sorts of um uh, observations uh, in the early 20th century um, is one of the reasons that it entered, entered for example, eventually people like Hancock's um, sphere of of, uh, of inspiration is that uh, these are dramatic events as described. Um, but in this instance, it seems like uh, the, there's, there's reason to doubt that this actually occurred. Um, for example, the burning you were saying could have been you know everyday events like uh, cremations and uh, perhaps even controlled burning on land that kind of thing that's right i mean basically the uh, the counter article um came out um in in august this year um at the, at the beginning of the month and it's titled um yeah, without any hedging refuting the sensational claim of a hopewell ending cosmic airburst Mm. And again, it's by multiple authors, um, in, including people who 
work on the Hopewell culture in Ohio. Um, and basically, again, I'll, I'll just read you a, um, a short extract from the introduction, which sort of sets the claim. But um, both articles, I should say, uh, uh, will link to below the line, and both are available under op open access. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, it, for once, we can do a, a direct comparison, and, and, and our viewer can do, a, if they're interested, can do a direct comparison about what was claimed and then how it uh, how it's transpired. Um, but basically, um, the introduction to the refutation states um, Tankersley at all. Tankersley is the lead author of the of the claim. Uh, claim a cosmic airburst over modern day Cincinnati, Ohio in the third or fourth century common era catalyzed the decline of the Hopewell culture. This claim is extraordinary in the face of hundreds of archaeological investigations in the middle Ohio River Valley that have heretofore provided no evidence of widespread cataclysm or social design in need of explanation. And then, I mean, this is um, this is like a, an academic mugging. Mm -hmm. Quote, Tankersley et al. misrepresent primary sources, conflate discrete archaeological contexts, improperly use chronological analyses, insufficiently describe methods, and inaccurately characterize the source of supposed extraterrestrial materials to support an incorrect conclusion. Mm. Ouch. Mm. Um, on, on, on the burning specifically, they, the, 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 uh, again, the introduction to the refutation states, quote, while charcoal and burned soils are found on virtually all excavated middle woodland archaeological sites in the region, these have prosaic explanations. Many of the burned, quote, habitation services, end quote, mentioned, are actually prepared services for ceremonial fires, not the result of synchronous regional catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And it goes on. I mean, it, it is an absolute demolition job mm. on the original article um and as you see from, from you know it was published on 9th of august the um the refutation that uh, uh, has come before the end of august mm. Mm. um the, the, you know the, the, the situation was clearly untenable mm. um so, and, it was, so it was published it was published in 2023 then not 2022 uh, the original article was published in February 2022. The mm -hmm. refutation came in August of this year, 2023, mm -hmm. and the um, and, and the retraction note uh, came on the 30th of August. Yeah. So yeah. within a month of the refutation article, right, right, um, yeah. I should add that uh, the refutation note states that James A. Jordan, who is one of the authors of the contentious article, has accepted the refutation. Um, the other authors, including um, Kenneth kind of Tankersley, who's named as the, as the sort of lead author, the corresponding author on the on the paper, um, quote, did not respond to correspondence from the editors about this retraction. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, it's interesting because obviously this this sort of thing um, has been put to bed quite conclusively there, but uh, I suspect mm. um, <laughs> if people want to. They will see this as uh, proof that the establishment does not like these ideas getting out there and so on and so forth. Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to bet um, good money or Bitcoin, probably more appropriately, that on, somewhere on the Internet, as we speak, somebody is publishing something which says that big archaeology has once again hidden the truth from yeah. the people. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Curious thing. Um, speaking of the truth and the people, uh, you've noticed that Restore Trust are uh, geeing up candidates and adverts uh, leading up to the National Trust's um, council votes. Um, uh, is there anything really to say about that other than you will see these adverts on your, your social media feeds and be aware? That's right. Um, the um, for, for, Again, new viewers start, start here. Uh, Restore Trust is a pressure group that was set up supposedly to... Um, return the National Trust, the Brit Britain's probably leading uh, heritage charity and, and landowner, uh, to its core values uh, and uh, eliminate woke things like asking um, public-facing uh, members of staff to wear rainbow lanyards during Pride Month and that kind mm. of thing. Um, the, uh, for the last couple of years, they've run a slate of candidates for the annual National Trust Council elections and uh, in fact on 1st of September the day we're recording voting for this year's 
uh, National Trust Council started for the National Trust members. Right. And um, the um, Restore Trust slate of candidates are there to try and get onto the trust and basically influence its decision making and its policies mm. uh, in the direction that they uh, that, that, that they propose. Now, all well and good, you might say, it's a, you know, it's a democratic vote. It's overseen by a, a, an independent um, you know, uh, voting organisation uh, to ensure fair play. And um, people are entitled to stand and people can start to put views. The problem with Restore Trust is that it is widely regarded as what's called an AstroTurf group. Uh, an AstroTurf group being a, an apparently public, um, a public organization, an organization that's been generated by public opinion that is actually a pressure group that's being supported and paid for by lobbyists. And in this case, it's the uh, right wing lobbyists that are, shall we say, Tufton Street adjacent. Yeah. Tufton Street being the shorthand for um, opaquely funded right of center lobbying of government. And, and, Astro, and um, Astro, this, AstroTurf being fake grassroots, basically. Yes, yeah. exactly. If people aren't, aren't familiar with the term. So, yeah, basically, so basically it's fake grassroots, mm. um, a fake grassroots organization. Um, the advertising it, this year, it, it's um, basically in the last few years, uh, Restore Trust has failed utterly to break through. Mm hmm. It's made a lot of noise in the media, partly because a lot of its um, outriders are associated with the right-wing media, particularly the Daily Telegraph. Mm. Um, in fact, one of the um, candidates this year the, on the slate is a former uh, Telegraph sketch writer right. and, um, a, a, and, and journalist. Um, but um, the, the advertising, it, uh, it, this year it, it's very glossy. Some of it at least appears to be associated with the right of centre TV channel, the, the anti-woke TV channel, GB News, mm -hmm. um, which is controversial because of its associations with people like Nigel Farage, um, numerous conservative right-wing MPs who've been given shows, um, and, he, uh, and, and also uh, including uh, the, the, some of the, uh, the current deputy chair of the Conservative Party, who's nicknamed 30P Lee Anderson. Mm. Um, but um, particularly... Um, Nigel Farage has appeared on a Restore Trust uh, advert uh, asking people to uh, vote to knock some sense into the National Trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the idea of, you know, the, 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 one of the tropes on the right wing being that, um, co you know, common sense, ordinary people don't go with this wokeism stuff. That and said, so why, the, and why, why, why are we getting the, these adverts um, so much attention then? Because it's basically it's a heads up. It's not be t it, it's to tell people not to be taken in that, that, that Restore Trust isn't a genuine public organisation. They're lobbyists. Mm -hmm. um, the you know uh, and you know although they would say again you know they they would deny absolutely I'm sure any claims of um, white nationalism and, and racism that the subliminal images uh, or the images subliminally might seem to off their audience um yeah for example the the director of restore trust is a woman from global majority uh, of mm -hmm. ethiopian heritage mm -hmm. so you know it, it, it's uh it, it's really just to be aware and we'll, we'll be covering another story where this comes becomes an issue later in the show but the uh, it's about how the public space is being, well, there are attempts to occupy the public space by paid for lobby groups rather than uh, who are trying to drive their own agendas by co-opting charities and public organisations like the National Trust. Yeah, yeah. Also, as well, it's worthwhile remembering that the National Trust slogan slogan is forever for everyone, not forever for Middle England. Mm. So um, hopefully uh, this membership will bear that in mind. Next, we have uh, the story of Antoine, Antoinette Sandbach, a former MP who's been asked to be removed mm. 
from slavery research. One of her ancestors was a uh, slave owner, and uh, she is uncomfortable being uh, associated with with this fact and with this uh, with this project. Uh, do you think she has a point? Um, interestingly, yesterday on uh, Twitter, um, David uh, Olasoga uh, made a point of describing her ancestors' holdings, uh, particularly lim lumping human beings in with livestock when they died, this kind of thing. Um, I, I don't know yeah. about you, but personally, I feel as though if, if one of my ancestors owned slaves, I would want to know about it, and I wouldn't be too bothered about telling other people about it. It would be an opportunity to talk, not, not something to be ashamed of. After all, you and I, for example, have not ever owned a person, have we? And presumably neither as, as Antoinette. <laughs> no, no, no. And in in fact, when it was um, when it went online, I actually checked the um, the, the, the database of mm. uh, people who were given compensation when slavery was abolished. Uh, uh, slavery was abolished in the British Empire, mm. uh, and uh, to check whether anybody. That we know of in our family tree had been given compensation for for owning or having investments in companies which dealt in enslaved African people, uh, and I'm very pleased to say that at the moment it appears they didn't. Hmm. Um, you know, but as you say, if if I were to find that out, I'm not responsible for what they did two three hundred years ago. No, but because as a human being, I need to respond to that issue now in 2023. I quite like to know. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I think, well, I, I don't want to impute motives to somebody who I've never met, who I haven't discussed this with. But I think Antoinette Sambach's uh, move, which is basically to approach Cambridge University, where um, a man called um, Malik al-Nazir is uh, undertaking doctoral research, uh, which involves... Uh, research into her family's investments in mm. what's now Guyana, formerly British Guyana, Demerara. Um, the it comes against the background of an increasingly loud debate about, for example, uh, or often called reparations, mm. about whether organisations and families who were enriched by the trade in enslaved African people. Mm -hmm. Um, should make financial atonement now in the 21st century when those investments become public and become more understood and the fact that, for example, there can be a direct line from companies uh, to the, the, the modern world mm -hmm. and land holdings and building the ownership of buildings and the ownerships of, uh, ownerships of estates and things like that. Mm -hmm. In fact, the kind of thing that we were talking about in the previous item with the, which the National Trust is looking at precisely that kind of thing um and crucially it's worthwhile yeah. saying that even though even though you and i can can rest assured that we personally haven't done anything like that uh i, I and even though to my to my knowledge my family ha uh, has never been in a position to do that sort of thing uh we do nonetheless as you say benefit from those foundational institutions that were were set up on the backs literally on the backs of of that of that slave trade um, the Bank of England, for example, <laughs> you know, touches everyone's lives in uh, in 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 the UK um, and beyond. You know, it's uh, so it's it's one of those com very complicated th things where, uh, as you say, maybe the the crucial factor here is that uh, in her case, she may not want to be asked to pit to get into reparations. Um, in a personal sense, as opposed to uh, the, a broader national conversation about about the implications of 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 that time and the and modern times. Mm. Um, I mean, do, 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 yeah. do, 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 in that sense, do you have sympathy for for not wanting to be named? In a, the problem is though, she it's the Barbara Sat Streisand effect, isn't it? She by by saying I don't want to be named, now I know she was named. I wouldn't have known <laughs> had she not mentioned it. <laughs> That's exactly the point. And in fact, as of this morning, from the, from the Barbara Streisand effect, is Barbara Streisand is there's a whole new album mm. uh, been released over this. I mean, basically, what happened was um, 
uh, and it's not clear entirely how it came about. It appears to have broken, um, been uh, largely broken by the BBC. Um, but um, so, Antoinette Sandbach, she's a former Conservative MP. She was she was one of the MPs who actually left the Conservative Party over Brexit. Mm. Uh, she was one of the ones who was um, kicked out by Boris Johnson, and she was briefly Liberal Democrat, if I remember rightly. Um, and you know, she, she's not associated with the you know the head banging alt right. Mm. But um, basically, Malik Al Nazir named her in a TEDx talk. Mm. She took, uh, according to the correspondence that, uh, and, 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 and the statements that have been released by the various parties, she appears to have taken exception to that on the grounds that uh, there were many other living rev relatives, uh, which is, you know, true. Any, anyone who does family research knows, you know, that for one person now, there are, you, you know, we go back far enough in, in history and everybody's related to Genghis Khan. You know, it's that, um, mm -hmm. that, that, that factoid of, um, uh, 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 of genealogy. Mm -hmm. um, so why her in particular? Um, and, and she argues that there's no public interest in that. And she's basically um, trying to apply privacy legislation, GDPR and so on, to, uh, to this particular issue. Um, Mr. Al-Nazir and his supporters say, wait a minute, this is academic research. Mm. And I'm not accusing her of anything. I'm just pointing out that you know, she's there as, as, as a figure in public life, uh, or certainly has been in public life, you know, serving a governing party, mm -hmm. um, and living on, you know, uh, uh, being associated with family companies and, and land holdings. And um, it's perfectly legitimate. It's not blaming her. It's just pointing out that this is a fact of life. And that, you know, families who made those investments back in the 17th 18th early 19th century many of them are still are in public uh in, in public life for example uh, the family is distantly related to the gladstone family and the father of william Ewart gladstone the li famously liberal prime minister mm. um has also been uh, associated with slave owning and um prime minister gladstone has been his reputation has been under question as a result of it mm. um yeah so this is you know this is, this is sort of complicated stuff she well, argues she's well, got the right to be forgotten. I, well, she, she, I, she, she can argue that, but also her family were uh, compensated for 600 slaves in the uh, in the Compensation uh, mm. Act. Um, and their company dealt, uh, and not surprisingly, being linked with uh, the, the word demerara, um, uh, dealt in sugar, molasses, rum, and, mm. and slaves. So, um, yeah, it is, it's, 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 as you say, it is quite that, going to be complicated. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, th this is a this was a business empire. Um, mm. the, the the particular person um, that Mr. Al Nazir is looking at, or one of the particular people that Mr. Al Nazir is looking at, is a man called Samuel Sandbach, mm. who's described as a, a, a sla literally as a slave trader, a trader in enslaved people, mm. um, and he co-founded a firm called Sandbach Tin and Co. based in Liverpool. Um, Liverpool being one at one end of what was often called the slave trade triangle, mm. um, and you know, the, the names are the same. She, you know, he's a sandbag. Yeah. So you could, you, you, you know, somebody with a vague knowledge of modern politics might almost ask the question, right? If you, if, you know, it's not a particularly common name, so you might actually recognize it. But as I say, I think a lot of it is to do with it. Uh, uh, and I think may, maybe people in this kind of situation, and I'm not, I'm not ascribing this motive to her at all. Um, but with the arguments that I talked about earlier about whether reparations are owed to if not individuals to the mm. countries which were built on literally the blood and sweat of enslaved african people mm -hmm. um that uh, pressure might come on those families to pay to, to pay now in a number of cases uh people who are descended from slave owners have taken steps to um, not atone for the past, but explain the role of their ancestors in the past and maybe offer something back. Um, two cases spring to mind, uh, the Earl of Harwood, um, who uh, was famously associated um, 
uh, became associated with this through um, programs made by the actor David Howard, um, who has his surname because his ancestors were once owned by the Earl's ancestors. Right. Mm. Mm. And, um, and and another case, um, a, a former BBC reporter called Laura Trevelyan, um, who recently retired from the BBC and is now fronting up a family attempt to um, deal with its the Trevelyan's family heritage as uh, descendants of you know slave owners, people who profited from enslaved people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Yeah, it's knotty, uh, uh, and uh, I think the, uh, the 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 talk around this is only going to get louder, um, and ultimately, I think it's going to come down to what the monarchy decides to do. Um, yeah, and I, th I think it's worth pointing out here. I mean, I mean uh, you know, at risk here is, uh, in 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 one case, and we and we, you know we've just talked about an article that was. Um, refuted and uh, in, in academic discourse here we could be talking about academic work which is not even refuted but is actually suppressed by somebody claiming privacy mm. Mm. and that is a slippery slope i think mm. um and certainly there's no suggestion that uh, his, in his academic work mr Alnazir is anything other than uh, utterly professional um in fact he's um he he's won um uh at least two significant prizes for uh, his uh, his literary and academic uh, historical research at Cambridge. Hmm. Um, so, you know, it, it's um, it's a it's a tricky it's a it's a tricky one. And, and, and in fact, up until the, you know, the, the, um, Sam Batch's um, initial approach to the university was to the university it wasn't to mr al nazir i mean I, I, I mean as he i mean he told the bbc um quote the uh, the threat of legal action is an affront to academic freedom as a historian it's imperative i have academic freedom to research history and display without fear or favor what i find and that's that's really what's at stake here isn't it and uh, especially mm. in, in the context of that that story about uh, the restore trust group and the national trust that kind of thing yeah yeah um, now again, I, I think we have we have to be fair to Antoinette Sandbach. She's um, and again, she's quoted by the BBC after they published in, in their roundup of this. Uh, she said, "quote uh, that she was quote appalled by the actions of my distant ancestors," and 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 then she's also quoted as saying that she would quote never seek to prevent free speech or suppress academic research. In this case, I objected to ongoing data breaches by Cambridge University and Mr. Al Nazir, which compromised my personal safety. And added that she'd been repeatedly threatened by a number of people over her position on Brexit when she was an MP. Now that's a complete that that, that is entirely credible that you know mm -hmm. um, anti-Brexiters were threatened, um, particularly those in public life. Mm. But there's not a connection between that and her family's role several hundred years ago as slave owners. No. Um, and so you know it, it's it. it it, it's it is tricky, and obviously we're dealing with a very complex, very sensitive area. But at the same time, that's no reason. I think, put it this way: uh, if somebody found out something about my grandfather or my great grandfather uh, that's not to their credit, I'm not responsible for that. Mm -hmm. And if it's in the public interest, and I think arguably you could say, you know, the, what happens to, you know, the, what what's the descent of that money? in the 18th and 19th century and where it where it and where the impact of that trade appear now mm -hmm. um that's in the public interest yes absolutely speaking of the public interest here's a brief message from us and the watching brief on how you can support us in our continuing efforts to bring these sorts of issues to your attention we'll be back after this a watching brief is a formal program of observation and investigation to record and report on notable discoveries on an archaeological site. As part of our ongoing watching brief, Andy and I work hard to bring you the best, the worst and sometimes the more quirky happenings from the world of archaeology. We aim to provide a space where voices can be heard, opinions shared and sometimes truth spoken to power. If you believe in the work we do, please consider supporting us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month. Thank you.
So now we come to a follow-up interview with Reese Booth and uh, really a reflection on what were fairly uh, prescient comments in his previous interview with regards to legislation proposed in Western Australia that was meant to uh, protect uh, um, Aboriginal First Nation um, uh, First Peoples rights in Australia and balance those rights with the needs of the modern world planning, farming, mining agriculture uh, and, and other other uh, you know gardening, other ways in which the, the ground can be disturbed by modern life and uh, at the time uh, this was a, a month or so ago certainly a few weeks ago, Reese was concerned that perhaps the laws weren't going to work smoothly and really since then we've seen nothing but people complaining there's been been lots of very uh angry and irritated and uh and and rightfully um frustrated people in the news in various capacities and uh and we we, we had simply had to go back to reese and and see what he thought of it um what did you make of 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 this going into the conversation with reese andy well uh, as a a fan of um, political satire and uh, so, uh, and um, and so on. I couldn't help but think of the uh, famous word that was coined um, by the writers of a British TV show called "The Thick of It," mm. um, which satirises uh, politicians and their PR people. And that word is omni shambles, yeah. and that is an idea that something is so catastrophic that mm. it, it is an omniscient shambles. Mm -hmm. um there is absolutely nothing that works in, in this in connection with this particular thing and 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 it looks like what the government of western australia uh, as uh, i mean i don't think even reese predicted it would be quite as bad as it's turned out to be because um what we have is the kind of omni shambles where a government introduces uh, a state government in this case introduces a piece of high profile heritage legislation and within months has to rescind the thing and um, is desperately trying to um, rework it to save something from the rubble. Mm. Um, it's a fascinating story about sensitive, how not to do sensitive, her responsible heritage legisl legislation. Um, you know, you know, frankly, it's just, it's just it's just pleasant that it's not it's not uh, it's not you know it's not Britain it's not Westminster doing this for once. <laughs> I, it's just amazing. I'm not going. I, I, I'm not. I'm not going. Look, I'm not going there. And uh, and to be fair, I don't think we'd particularly go there in the interview. No, no. But look, I mean, it it, it 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 is something I think that people who study heritage law and um, ethics will be looking at for a long time. Uh, so here's the interview. Uh, here's the conversation I had with Reese earlier. Reese, thank you again for joining us on uh, on the Watching Brief. Now. Viewers might remember that a few months ago we talked about the change to heritage law in Western Australia, which was designed to remedy the defects that were made obvious by the uh, what I think was known as the Rukin Gorge case or the Rukin Gorge scandal, even where the uh, aggregates and minerals company Rio Tinto blew up. Uh, some uh, indigenous uh, people's uh, cave sites that were potentially some of the oldest on the uh, whole continent of Australia. Uh, it ended up with a major scandal, as I said, and the resignation of the head of the company uh, and uh, a sense that the government needed to make sure this couldn't happen again. Now, when we last spoke, uh, West Australia had introduced new heritage laws, but they were proving very controversial, particularly among uh, farming groups. And there was a petition to uh, rescind the, the new law. Can you bring us up to date on what's actually happened? Yeah, sure thing. So cards on the table. Um, I am a card carrying member of the Australian Labor Party. So just to throwing my political um, out, out there just to um, show any kind of agenda, I suppose. But um, what has happened is that less than six weeks after the laws came into effect after July 1st, they've been repealed. And the 1972 Western Australia Heritage Act has now been put into force again with uh, minor changes, I'm told. Um, and I was basically uh, informed, uh, well, everybody's been informed that it was because the act itself had been rushed and that 
it wasn't working for anybody. Now, uh, I'm looking at a, uh, an account of uh, what's happened from the um, international news agency Reuters, and we'll link to this below the line. It's a pretty good, I think, uh, summary of what's happened. Um, but Reuters certainly state that when the legislation came into force, which was as recently as the 1st of July, um, it seems to have pleased nobody. Um, Reuters claim that uh, farmers, who I mentioned before, but also indigenous groups and uh, mining companies all said that it was uh, opaque, overcomplicated, overprescriptive, and the processes weren't really clear. It sounds like a complete proverbial uh, mess. Yeah, and um, some of the, the thing is, is that we do have to dig a little deeper than what um, some aspects of the media are saying. Um, obviously, um, right-wing media has an agenda, especially with mining um, in Australia and the Murdoch press, uh, who will always portray this kind of thing in a bad light. Uh, however, there were aspects um, of the act that simply just did not work in anybody's favour. So we'll start off with the farmers. Um, there were basically parts of the act which suggested that if you excavated in areas, removed about 50 centimetres of soil uh, from an area that hadn't been uh, touched before, um, that you would need to get a uh, Aboriginal heritage advisor uh, to come out and would have to do a heritage check um, of the works and do testing before um, that could go on. And of course, that is, uh, could end up being thousands and thousands of dollars to simply put in a, uh, a, well, a paddock fence. Um, by comparison to where I live in Victoria, we have multiple checks and balances on uh, um, works like that where um, those kinds of works can only be triggered if they're in a particular geographical region, so um, within about 200 metres of a named waterway or within about 50 metres of an existing uh, Indigenous site um, that we know about. That's when um, some activities will trigger a cultural heritage investigation however it's what's it in, seems that it, so i was gonna say it's, it's what in the uk um in, in, we have um, archaeologically sensitive areas which automatically tr trigger extra scrutiny under the planning system i guess you're, you're talking about something similar that's that's exactly right it, it's um those particular areas so that's the first trigger is that um if there's any kind of activity that's happening uh, development-wise in an area like that, that's the first trigger. The second trigger is what type of activity it is. Does it constitute a, um, a basically a heavy activity? Is it Are you developing, you know, houses? Are you only putting in a slab of concrete on the surface, for example? Is that type of activity going to be subsurface in nature? That kind of thing. Um, the Western Australia Act, although it does list activities, I don't think it had multiple triggers, which means that any kind of uh, work, I suppose, within within that you know that sphere could have triggered an investigation. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that, but that's the understanding that we get from everything that's come out of the um, come out of the case so far. Can I ask another question? Um, some um, authorities, some commentators have linked this to uh, a forthcoming referendum in, in, in Australia, uh, the, the Voice to Parliament referendum. Uh, can you explain for, for people who aren't uh, familiar with the situation in, in, in Australia, particularly with regards to Aboriginal peoples and the political system and uh, political representation. What, what's the referendum about? All right, so um, the current federal government's asking for a referendum to update the constitution, basically acknowledging Aboriginal Australians as the first Australians um, and enshrining a, um, a voice to parliament, which would be um, an Aboriginal advisory committee which would advise the government on policies that directly, or even in some cases probably indirectly, um, have effects on Aboriginal communities within Australia. Now, 
we're going to be going to a vote in less than two months about this. And it doesn't at this stage, all the polls are saying different things, but most of them are trending to say that it's probably not going to pass. Um, and this is, this is where things get um, quite political in that the right wing of Australian politics, uh, for the most part, is saying uh, is running the no campaign and the progressive and the left wing are generally associated with the yes campaign. Um, now, the no campaign has used the failure of these laws um, to push their agenda, basically saying that this is a taste of what the voice could bring, um, which is no real um, validity to those claims because we're talking about state heritage legislation, not federal government um, legislation. And to be quite honest, anything that The Voice could say to the Australian Federal Parliament can be ignored by the Australian Federal Parliament. They don't have to listen to The Voice. So which then allows, which has a lot of people thinking, well, what's the point of an, uh, you know, an advisory body that doesn't have to be listened to? It's just paying a lip service. So it's it's kind of one of these things that there's, there's a whole lo lot of moving parts to it. And yes, this Heritage Act of, um, that's come in has basically become a bit of fodder for the No campaign. And, and in fact, as I understand it, um, some Indigenous leaders have suggested that scrapping the, the law, uh, the new law in Western Australia, could actually neutralise some of the um, some of the opposition to the voice to, uh, to parliament um, vote um, a referendum yeah potentially um i don't know if there was any pressure coming from above i know some um uh some news um, presenters have certainly said that um and made that claim that that's a potential reason why but the federal government's come out and completely denied that they've put any downward pressure on getting rid of the law before this happens. Um, so I I don't know, <laughs> I suppose is the easiest answer there. Um, but I have a feeling that it, it simply, it, it, the legislation simply didn't work for most people involved. And I think that was the key issue. Um, and I think what's interesting is that the Western Australian government hasn't said that they're going to simply revise the laws and come up with a new Heritage Act. They've reverted back to the 1972 laws with some updates. And that in itself is really, really interesting because effectively it means that we are still kind of stuck with the same laws that allowed Junic and Gorge to happen. And whether or not those updates that they've uh, put into the Act, um, whether they'll be sufficient to stop that from happening again, I don't know. I, th I think it's worth saying, actually, um, it's not a complete repeal, is it? The, the, the legislation is actually being amended um, to uh, make it less blanket and more permissive. So, for example, um, Aboriginal cultural heritage will still be overseen by what's described as a majority Aboriginal administrative body and that um, Aboriginal groups will retain a right to review um but the state minister has the final say um yeah. and um th it, there are also um as, an, a, a, as i understand it there's an amendment um, which will um require a, a a landowner a property owner a mining company to notify the state minister of any new information about it uh, one of the arguments about uh, the, the the gorge uh destruction was that uh, state officials um uh, and even the uh, senior management of Rio Tinto um, weren't informed about new, inf new, ar new archaeological historical information about the site before it was destroyed. Yeah, which then goes to, is it a failure of the heritage advisors that were working on that site? Is it a failure of the company? Is it a failure of the state? Is it a failure of all three? Um, I, I couldn't tell you, but I think that to allow people to self-report these sites was extraordinarily problematic um, mm. because, well, the fact of the matter is, is see no evil, hear no evil, pay no fee. Mm. 
um, who's who's gonna who's gonna you know on a on a hundred thousand five hundred thousand dollar investment property say oh yeah by the way we found um two indigenous burials and x y and z or something like that when they know it's going to cost them you know another ten th tens of thousands of dollars to potentially get it looked at you know it doesn't self-reporting and self-regulation like that really does not work in my personal view um and it, it it is it is kind of like that in my state where after an investigation has been done after the cultural heritage management plan has been put in place that legal document's been put in place basically the company has to follow that legal document so if anything's found they have to report it but of course who's there to make them report it i mean the rap or the registered aboriginal party can make um, an audit and they quite often do they're quite thorough on these things where they'll go out to a site and they they might take a quick look around and things like that however that's not to say that the other 90% of the time when they're not on site, that something isn't found and simply not recorded. And, and, and just to go back to the, uh, and again, again it, it's something we're uh, less familiar with in the UK, although perhaps our colleagues in the United States, uh, where there's a similar federal system, um, might be more familiar with this kind of issue. Um, again, it's important to stress that th we're talking here about the state of Western Australia which has its own government and its own systems. But I also understand that um, the federal government uh, in, in Canberra is due to release uh, new standards next year, which again are designed to prevent at a federal level another uh, Junicum Gorge uh, cultural disaster, basically. Uh, yep, yep. And that's... I mean, it, it's interesting, like it's, it's a good thing that they're actually doing it, but um, it's also, I would say to a point ineffective because it, that, that particular legislation only applies to land that is directly controlled by the federal government. And I'm not even sure how far that goes. So you might be talking about national parks. That's like the primary one, or maybe any works that are, um, done by, um, for example, the freeways and the highways. A lot of those are run by the federal government. Um, so any works to do with them, possibly in part in the like in the territories. So Canberra itself might be one particular area, but it, it's I'm I'm not quite flush with uh, federal heritage law because it, again it doesn't actually come up that much. It's a very small amount of land that is directly governed by the federal government. So we're talking about things like military bases. Um, so those laws will apply there, but it it might be a bit of a, um, uh, I suppose, uh, a PR, a bit of a PR thing uh, mm -hmm. to kind of go, okay, at least the federal government's doing the right thing. And I think it's worth saying here as well that Royces are certainly reporting that um, a, 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 an Aboriginal representative group, a national representative group, the National Native Title Council, uh, says that, uh, again, a cultural disaster like Ginnikan Gorge could happen again because a lot of heritage sites are on private land and private farmland, which, again, are uh, to a degree out of control and below the radar. That's exactly right. And this is, again, this comes down to the whole idea of self-reporting and self-regulation. Um, a lot of sites, see, the thing is, though, you've got to also empathise with farmers um, and other people that really don't know what these sites look like. When we're talking about a lot of these Aboriginal uh, sites, uh, what we're talking about is um, stone debitage, usually on a surface or just um, below the surface. So that's where somebody um, over the vast history of um, Aboriginal time here has made a stone tool of some description um, and all the flakes. So if um, you imagine like somebody making like a like a smith making a sword, you see all that stuff, all the sparks and that come off that sword. That's the kind of stuff we find, but in stone form. It's all the debitage from that process. Those are sites um, and they're the vast majority of sites in this country um, and I would never expect a lay person to know what that looks like um, because we're trained for many years to kind of identify these things 
Um, and it is a specialization within archaeology itself, itself uh, lithic technology, um, which most Australian archaeologists are trained to do so, but not all. Um, and I think, I think a good example, I suppose, of this, if this act um, not pleasing everyone, um, for this was pertinent, um, is there was a story that came out about a um, ecological uh, group that was meant to be planting thousands of trees um, in Western Australia. However, because of the new act, they weren't actually able to do so. And that was um, kind of bundled up in the um, in, in the bureaucracy. And what ended up happening is a lot of the saplings died. So thousands of dollars of donated, um, you know, for a good cause, um, uh, sapling yeah these saplings just all, all ended up um uh, withering away and the whole thing ended up uh, being turned on its head because of these laws and obviously aboriginal communities themselves didn't want this kind of thing happening um it, it puts uh, they wanted to work they want these laws to work for everybody and aboriginal communities themselves understand that if these laws are to work they need to be streamlined they need to be easy to understand and they need to be applied when appropriate and i think that's that's the key thing is that these laws missed their target um in their application i think it's perhaps a, a, a good point to end on and maybe to observe that uh, wherever you are in the world, and I think particularly in a, in a situation like uh, in Western Australia, where, then, where there are so many people with le who are legitimate stakeholders, um, it's complicated. And you need to do the work and get the drafting right to make sure it doesn't just look good on the page, but it'll actually work in, in reality. Um, thank you, uh, Reese uh, Reese Booth, for for, for joining us from uh, from Australia. But before we go, I, I just need to ask you if you and, and I'm going to do I'm going to be really unfair and ask you to do it in just a few sentences. But um, uh, Mr. Soup and I are about to discuss uh, certain things that have been going on at a certain world famous museum in Bloomsbury in London. <laughs> um, the um, the the allegation that. Um, Artifacts have been um, removed uh, unlawfully from the British Museum and may even have been sold on eBay. Um, how's that playing in Australia? Uh, sorry, I've just got to hide this first. Um, no, <laughs> no, I bought that at the Melbourne Museum when there was, there was an exhibit going on there, but it's not the real thing. It's just a paperweight. Um, no, how's that playing out? Um, well, it's it's world news. It's not it's not just news in the UK. Um, I mean, the BBC is international. Um, and we see it a lot in the Australian broadcaster as well, the ABC. Um, we, in particular, I was reading an article about how China's put in claims now to have um, certain items returned. And uh, basically, this has been used as a way to, I suppose, attack the, um, uh, the British Museum uh british museum's legitimacy um in a way and and as it should it should it should if this has been happening for a while and and i know that there's a bit of a background here where this might have come up four years ago that this might have been happening and if this kind of thing was put under a rug absolutely there needs to be some type of investigation because i would expect any institution around the world who had a similar thing going to do the exact same thing um but i also would probably point out that this person and the reasons they've done what they've done it still hasn't come out and in the i suppose in the in the wider west for the most part we have this assumption of innocence until proven guilty and i think a lot of people still like not everybody has faith in that process these days but I believe that there needs to be a process where an investigation needs to take place and then the time for uh, judgment happens after when we have all the facts as to why and how it happened. And, and, and again, um, whenever we're discussing this, we're very aware that there is a live police investigation going on at the moment and we're not making any assumptions about any particular person's guilt or, 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 or innocence or even involvement. Uh, but just one uh, very quick question just 
finally, you know, as, as a uh, heritage professional, as an archaeologist, um, but also as an Australian, uh, albeit one who's a UK dual national, as I understand it. Um, do you have a different view of the British Museum now to that you might have had maybe a couple of weeks ago before this came out? Um, I'm disappointed, but uh, I think at the first stage, I would have been disappointed that that individual has done what they've done. But you can't, you know, archaeologists aren't always the good guys, uh, as Mr. Soup often says. Um, we're, we're human. And selling off artifacts um, is actually really, really easy to do. A lot of people won't believe this, but um, over here it's illegal to sell uh, bottles, which are, you know, collector's items to a lot of people. You know, people go out and dig those up and sell them. It's very easy to do. So I can understand why this person may have gotten away with it for quite a long time, especially in annexes that a lot of people simply just don't go, except for academic purposes. It's easy to hide. But because the museum has reacted in what I would deem to be a very defensive, very quick way, um, it's like a, a knee-jerk reaction, I would probably say, is, is the way that the museums were. It, it, it does bring some question into who is running the museum and how it's being run and the kind of the ethos behind the museum. Maybe maybe they need to have a good hard look at um, about uh, you know at, at these things, and maybe it's time for a bit of a bit of change, a bit of change up top. And I think just to finish by saying, and I'm sure we'll we'll, we'll come to uh, talk about it in this in in a second when I talk to uh, Mr. Soup about this. Um, there has been change in that um, the director Herbig Fisher and his deputy have both left their posts in the last two weeks. Um, so. The organisation is now being fronted up by the Chair of Governors, George Osborne, former Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, therein lies another story, and we'll come to that in a minute. But um, once again, uh, Reesby, thank you very much for joining us on Watching Brief and uh, talking about the situation regarding cultural, Aboriginal cultural sites in Western Australia. I suspect it's something we'll be coming back to. Yep, not a problem, Andy. Always a pleasure. So, Struth, indeed, uh, the heck of a heck of a crisis down under, um, and um, uh, I don't know. I mean, hopefully, hopefully, someone's going to learn from this in terms of implementation of legislation, just to listen a little bit more, because uh, uh, as Reese has alluded yeah. to, there are examples from other states uh, where where they could be implementing rules in a different way. But also, it sounds as though no one involved with this. Um, thought it was a good idea it's fascinating how, how it's been pushed forward uh seemingly with with you know with the with the intention of no no this is going to be really good especially for you know it's just yeah <laughs> brexit <laughs> you see west i told you westminster it's just it's just wonderful not to have have it be london uh for once mm. um now speaking of london though uh, you did hint at this uh, towards the end of the interview there with uh, with Reese, but I think we want to just see what happens over the weekend before we we really tackle this issue in earnest. But it's worth touching on uh, at the British Museum uh, the fact that Carl Heron, an archaeologist, has been um, elevated, has been promoted to uh, the role as new acting deputy director of the British Museum. Um, and uh, there's a photo uh, of him uh, on this artnet.com uh, article, uh, courtesy of the University of York, in fact. Um, the British Museum promotes an archaeologist to effectively lead the institution in the wake of its embattled director's departure. Uh, is this going to be uh, someone who's going to go in and clean house and uh, take no nonsense? Or uh, is, it, uh, is this a caretaker appointment, do you think? What, what do you think? I uh, well, you know, knowing knowing the British <laughs> so that's Museum, a rhetorical question. knowing the British Museum, knowing uh, these sorts of institutions, I'm sure that they're going to want wholesale change. Uh, they're going to want you know closets to be open, open skeletons to be revealed, uh, quite literally in the yeah. case of the BM, and uh, and you know, and we're going to see a real, uh, you know, uh, a real laying down of the law. Yeah, absolutely, and I think we can expect um, wholesale staff changes and um 
Dr. Dan Hicks being imported, parachuted in as their <laughs> ethics and policy advisor. Yeah, with with some. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Thinking with some uh, with some napalm, just parachutes in. Um, yeah, no, yeah. it's not going to happen. No, look, so- I, I, and, again, and again, I, I, yeah, Dr. Hicks has done some brilliant work in exposing the uh, the issues around uh, colonial collections, particularly the Benin bronzes with his book, The Brutish Museums. Mm. Um, so, you know, uh, look, uh, we are going. I think we're going to return to this in a full length piece next time, yeah. but. For now, I think we're looking at a holding pattern, and I think we're doing that for a number of reasons. One is that, first of all, the British Museum is a huge bureaucratic organisation, and promoting an insider to act up as its head for the time being is about stability and about keeping the remaining staff on side, particularly when one of their senior colleagues has just been fired for allegedly disposing of artefacts on eBay. Mm. This is probably the most humiliating destabilizing thing that's happened in british the british museum world in certainly in my active career in heritage and archaeology and that includes covering things like the sale of sakemka from northampton mm. Mm. um you know you you cannot overestimate how bad this is for the image of the british museum in general and large national museums in, in you know in 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 particular as well mm. um the we can see that just from the number of um people who are jumping on the bandwagon to say that nothing in the british museum is safe uh, so uh, i mean at the moment uh we've got claims from uh, for, for for the returning of artifacts from china mm-hmm. we've had claims from greece on the path of the marbles nothing new there mm. uh, nigeria uh, for the Benin bronzes, nothing new there. There's an outstanding claim for a Moai from Easter Island. Um, and just in the last um, couple of days, um, some Welsh nationalists have demanded the return of the Mold Bronze Age Gold Cape mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, to, uh, to North Wales. Mm. Um, it's, it's open season, basically, on museum collections which have any kind of question about how they were sourced. And uh, even on some that weren't, uh, it weren't controversial before now mm, mm. and and part of that is because the the world of museums and heritage and ethics is changing mm. um, but also um, there is the spectacle of a world-class museum that doesn't appear to not even be able to control its collection but doesn't even know what it's got yeah um so No, uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, appointing a respected professional staffer to a post like that because you've just lost your entire senior management team, the director and the deputy director. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One resigns, one quite steps back. Um, The organisation was basically decapitated. Um, The response to the row was being fronted by the chair of governors, George Osborne. Now, George Osborne is a, enough of a politician to know that he doesn't want to be the last person standing when the proverbial hits the fan. No, no. He, he, and, uh, and the military have a phrase for a director appointed in a circumstance like this, which is a bullet magnet. Mm. Mm. Um, well, I think last yeah, time you uh, were saying that you didn't envy anyone in comms at the BM at the moment. I, I, probably, I certainly don't mm. envy anyone coming in to deputy or full-on directorship at the BM at the moment. No. Uh, no. And, it's, and, 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 you know, given that it's been an appointment by the government, it's only ever going to be a caretaker post. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a very, it's a very important caretaker post. And, uh, you know, and, and we wish anyone in that post and, and, and supporting, you know, the, the museum well in, in really unprecedented circumstances, like I was saying, but um, this is going to take a long time to, well, the practicalities are going to take a long time to sort out. There's still a live police investigation. A person has been interviewed, but there have been no charges brought yet, which is why we're not talking about that in detail. Mm, mm. Um, at, but uh, aside from the practicalities of what this is showing about the, connect, uh, the collection, there's reputational damage, which is probably take, going to take decades to, um, to recover from. 
if it ever does. It's, this is always going to be there on the record of the British Museum. And this this is why we're going to be talking about this next week, is that we we have, in fact, this week already spoken at length on this issue. I believe it was about four hours altogether. Four hours. They go four hour conversation altogether, yeah. uh, including one um, that bled, uh, that, that, that preempted our recording with Reese that lasted a good mm. couple of hours. Um, Actually, yeah, that, sorry, it's more, it's more than four hours. So I was forgetting that hours. one as well. Yes. I was just thinking, yes. yeah, I was just thinking you're, you're not, you're yeah. not at yeah. all. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. that incidentally, folks, support us on Patreon. Um, and also, you can buy our badges. <laughs> we spend a lot of time doing, doing watching brief. <laughs> um, but in this instance, what, uh, what concerns me is not that suddenly the BM's reputation is now in tatters and people can, can levy accusations. It is that it was already a deeply controversial museum. I cannot mention uh, the British Museum on Facebook, for example, without uh, a whole uh, ream of comments and of people going, ha, 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 it's just full of stolen stuff, isn't it? It's where all the world's stolen stuff is. Oh. Uh, it, not only does that have the effect of ignoring so many other of the world's large museums, great in the, in the sense of size, if nothing else, museums, and where they got their stuff from, um, but it also as well reduces... And has had the effect so far of reducing the genuine work that staff at the museum do. Hmm. I had to have a conversation about this last week on 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 in YouTube comments, outlining that uh, that people in the museum are not cynical, evil folks who support colonialism. For example, uh, in this article that we'll be showing below, it, it makes it clear that actually staff were flagging weaknesses in the cataloging uh, of material at the museum. For, for years and this 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 comes down to structural and managerial problem uh, yeah managerial uh, uh, cultural problems um but therefore and this is this is why our conversation went on for so long uh, mm. i can't help but think that it that the that the museum quite possibly has lost the arguments the moral arguments on as to why it should be trusted to look after after material um uh, and this is why so many people are are saying this there's been a, in, in fact a few news articles outright stating that in the headline the bm can no longer be trusted now I, i'm not saying that that's uh, you know as, as, again we need to have this conversation next week you and i andy um <laughs> and it's again. by no means simple in so much as the the actual scale it's not like someone has walked out of the out of the museum with uh, a piece of the parthenon marbles you know um uh, and also there's a complication there as well in some in so much as uh reallocation of members of staff are quite astonishing in that sense but again we'll come back to that next week um but uh, i i really do think if the, if the british museum wants to have any any ability to say to anyone ever again where the best place to look after this stuff it needs to be incredibly transparent from here out um and and it needs to be invested in you know, if Britain wants this prestige, which the government seems to enjoy, as you were saying, this is a political appointment um, in terms of the new deputy, uh, a caretaker deputy position. Um, if the British government wants that that soft power uh, that it has to, of having this material, uh, we need to pay for it because, uh, as it stands, it's 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 argu very arguably not safe, uh, and that's that's personally I find that embarrassing. I also find it infuriating. Uh, I also find it. Um, a genuine shame on behalf of, of friends and colleagues who I know who have and who do work in in archival, in um, educational, in research positions in and around the British Museum. You know, these are not bad people uh, and they yeah. do gra grapple with these these complex issues of ownership, a little bit like with the uh, Antoinette uh, Sandbach story earlier. None of those people took anything. <laughs> um, but... Uh, their relationship to the material is complex and often they are quietly l moving towards aspects of re of, rest re of restoration, repatriation. Um, but yeah. conversations like this, and there's instances like this rather, and conversations that then start up in and around government who dig their heels in and say, no, 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 we're not letting go of anything, um, just makes the whole thing, I think, even yeah. worse. I, I think just just to finish, and, and, and uh, I'd like also, to Also, you, let, you let me rub it on there, thank you. <laughs> you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't go ah 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 ah. 
That's I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping my my my, uh, my proverbial powder dry for, yeah. uh, for, for, for our full length discussion. No, look, um, no, th th this whole thing, and, and again, I'll leave this thought with our viewer, and um, I'll leave them also with an invitation in a moment. But um, I'll, I'll leave this thought with our viewer, uh -huh. which is that there are arguments in you know in, in, in paleontology, for instance, about evolution and whether evolution is a slow process, and incremental, or whether evolution can sometimes be kickstarted by a particular mm. event which forces uh, you know, plants, animals to evolve rapidly to survive an unprecedented situation. Mm. And I think potentially that's what we're, we're looking at here. Um, the invitation I think I'd like to offer, we, we, we're, we're flagging up that we're going to be doing a uh, it, it, depending on what happens over the weekend and mm. other things that emerge, it may turn into a full-length British Museum watching brief special. It's certainly going to be a longer piece mm. um, for next time, perhaps. Um, and this really is a public issue. And so if anybody watching the watching brief has any thoughts on this, has any questions you'd like to ask us, like us to try to answer in the course of as uh, watching brief package about what's happened at the British Museum, how it came about, what kind, what the collection is, what, how it, how it's administered, and so on. Please let us know. Mm. Uh, DMs are open. We've got an email address connected with the watching brief, and obviously you can ask below the line, and we'll do our best. We can't promise to answer every every question and every point, but we'll certainly do our best to make sure that the the coverage that we provide is, uh, you know, is is, is comprehensive and addresses genuine concerns mm. that, that that people have yeah yeah i think i think one of the questions I, i'm going to look into that i suspect there's no easy answer to is what it what percentage of the museum's contents is contested the problem is mm. though a lot of material is in was in private collections mm. and how that stuff was accrued there, the, mm. you, you can never fully answer so you know the, the, there's always going to be blurry lines and this uh, frankly though this does go for any museum uh, any collection of things frankly um so um but anyway nonetheless yeah uh definitely please do uh, get in touch and we shall uh, do our best to address that stuff um anyway uh do comment below as well with regards to our conversation with reese uh what did you think of those issues how do you how do you think um how do you think we, uh he did if nothing else on uh on highlighting and flagging the potential problems and uh, if there's anything, any other stories, anything else that you think we, we, we would be interested in covering or that you'd like to see us cover, again, do contact us in the various ways that are possible. Um, until next time, though, do consider supporting us on Patreon. Do consider buying our wonderful badges on Etsy. And until then, do take care. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>